All right, welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, vascular imaging number four. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, chest x-ray with comparison history of chest pain. Slide two of two, CT angiogram of the chest. All right, so we're looking at two AP portable chest x-rays, and compared to the prior study, you can see that there's been significant widening of the mediastinum. You get some normal widening of the mediastinum whenever you're doing a portable chest x-ray, especially if there are low lung volumes, but comparing these two studies, this is a pretty dramatic increase. And generally, you can use a rough measurement of greater than eight centimeters on transverse dimension as a definition for a widened mediastinum. And whenever you see a wide mediastinum, you should be concerned that there could be an expanding aortic aneurysm or an aortic dissection. So the patient then had a CT angiogram of the chest, and indeed you can see that there's a type A aortic dissection. So there's a dissection here with the flap involving the ascending thoracic aorta. So remember, aortic dissections occur when you have a tear in the intima, and then blood enters the medial layer of the aortic wall, and that forms a second blood-filled false channel or lumen within the wall. And again, most of these occur in elderly hypertensive patients, and type A is actually the most common, but that's also the most serious, and this requires surgical management because it's close to the coronary arteries, so you could get coronary artery occlusion from the dissection flap. It could also track into the aortic root, causing aortic incompetence, and then even rupture into the pericardial sac, resulting in cardiac tamponade. In this case, you can see that the aortic root is okay, it doesn't look involved, but the left coronary artery here is close to the dissection flap. It remains patent though and it's arising from the true lumen. So remember that the false lumen is usually larger than the true lumen and it's also usually less opacified than the true lumen. You can see the true lumen is enhancing a bit more brightly. Also you get that beak sign in the false lumen where you get this beaking and that helps tell you that you're in the false lumen. Sometimes you'll get a little thrombus forming in there even in the acute setting. And then you might also see the cobweb sign where you have bits of sheared media extending ribbon-like into the false lumen. So again, type A aortic dissection involves the ascending aorta and that requires surgical management. Unlike type B occurring distal to the brachiocephalic trunk, which tends to be treated with medical therapy, control of hypertension. Also, just incidentally, this patient also has small bilateral pleural effusions with a bit of basilar atelectasis there. All right, next case, what vein is this and what do these waves mean? So here we're looking at the typical waveform for a hepatic vein, and more specifically, this is the right hepatic vein. So looking above at this color Doppler image, the blue area represents blood flow away from the transducer. That's away from the liver towards the heart. And the red flow represents blood flow towards the transducer, which you typically see in the portal vein. So that's the color Doppler appearance. And then here below, we have the spectral Doppler waveform, the pulse Doppler appearance. And for the hepatic vein, this is described as triphasic, and some describe it more specifically as tetra-inflectional because it has these four peaks. And everything above the baseline is blood flow towards the liver, and everything below the baseline is blood flow away from the liver towards the heart. And you can see most of the hepatic vein flow is away from the liver towards the heart. So let's talk about these different peaks. So this first one above the baseline is known as the A wave. That's blood flow towards the liver, and that represents atrial contraction, causing increased right atrial pressure, and that occurs at the end of diastole. The next wave is the S wave. That's below the baseline, so that's blood flow towards the heart. And in ventricular systole, ventricular walls will contract and blood will exit the right ventricle. So then you get this negative pressure in the right atrium that will suck the blood out of the liver into the right atrium. And so this wave is caused by the downward motion of the atrioventricular septum during mid-systole in the setting of this decreasing right atrial pressure. So this will give you the largest downward pointing wave in the cycle. The next wave is this V wave. It's kind of a transitional wave, and that can peak below, at, or above the baseline. It's kind of variable. So the peak of this wave actually represents the opening of the tricuspid valve, which is the valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle, and that indicates the transition from systole to diastole. So the final wave is the D wave. That's also below the baseline, so that's blood flow towards the heart, away from the liver, and that initial downward sloping part is generated by that decreasing right atrial pressure from the rapid early diastolic right ventricular filling. And then the rising portion is due to this increasing right atrial pressure as the right ventricular blood volume increases. And then we get back to this A wave where the atrium will contract. 
All right, so those ASVD waves are the typical waveform you'll see for all the hepatic veins. All right, so a bonus question, can you name these veins? Well, we're looking at a transverse view of the liver, and here's the inferior vena cava. So this would be the right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, and the left hepatic vein. And this is a nice view to obtain when doing an ultrasound of the liver because it divides the liver into the different segments at this level. So this would be segment 7, segment 8, segment 4A, and segment 2. So if you had a lesion here, you could say that was in segment 4A. Another thing to remember, the hepatic veins at this level are above the portal veins, so they're superior to the level of the portal veins. Okay, next case slide, one of two right and left hepatic veins. Slide two of two linear images of the hepatic surface. Okay, so these waveforms look very different from the hepatic vein waveform we just looked at, right? So the direction of flow is normal. It's blue. It's going away from the liver towards the heart and below baseline. But instead of a triphasic or tetrainflectional appearance, it has more of a monophasic appearance. So it has decreased phasicity or decreased pulsatility. So what's causing that? Well, even on these images, you can see that there's some nodularity to the hepatic contour as well as some ascites. So this is decreased hepatic vein phasicity due to cirrhosis. So cirrhosis can compress the hepatic veins and cause this decrease in the normal phasicity that you would typically see. And it also causes this spectral broadening where you get this fuzziness in between the individual waveforms. And that can be caused by cirrhosis, but also anything that causes hepatic venous outflow obstruction, as well as hepatic vein thrombosis, which is Bud Chiari syndrome. And a great way to look for cirrhosis is to switch from the curved probe, which has increased penetration but decreased resolution, to this linear array probe, which will have decreased penetration of the ultrasound beam, but gives you much better resolution. So you can see the nodularity to the hepatic contour very well, as well as this ascites. We're seeing a bit of reverberation artifact here. And then also note the heterogeneous echo texture to the hepatic parenchyma, typical for cirrhosis. Case four, female with hypertension. This is a 3D volume rendered image of the renal arteries. Slide two of three, a focused image of the right renal artery. Final slide, these are bilateral curved planar reformatted images of the renal arteries. So what is the treatment for this condition? All right, so we're looking at a 3D volume rendered image here, and you can see there's some subtle beading of the renal artery contour, most pronounced at the mid to distal aspect of the renal arteries on the right. And we're seeing less pronounced beading on the left side as well. And if we focus in a bit more on that right renal artery, you can see that beaded contour much better with areas of intervening stenosis and dilatation. And this is fairly specific for fibromuscular dysplasia. So fibromuscular dysplasia, or FMD, is an idiopathic, non-inflammatory, non-atherosclerotic arterial disorder of typically small and medium-sized arteries. And what happens is segmental areas of collagen deposit and you get smooth muscle overgrowth within the artery. And it affects multiple arterial territories. Most commonly, you'll have the renal arteries. And the second most common area involved is the carotid artery. So fibromuscular dysplasia can cause stenosis and aneurysms, but it can also cause dissection of the involved arteries. And it's a cause of potential renovascular hypertension, which is what this patient had. And it's most common in females ages 15 to 50 years. Sometimes this appearance is called the string of beads appearance, and classically it's best described on digital subtraction angiography, but we can also see it quite well on CT angiography as well as MRA. And again, it usually involves the mid to distal renal artery. You can even see the distal branches having a beaded appearance here as well. The mental arteries. And FMD can be classified into five categories, depending on the vessel wall layer affected. I won't go into all of those, but the most common, 70%, is medial dysplasia. And sometimes these curved planar reformats can show the disease very nicely here. You can see the beaded contour here on the right renal artery, and you see the less pronounced disease on the left renal artery here with these asymmetric saculations. So the typical treatment, if the patients are symptomatic, would be percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, or PTA. And that's actually quite successful. The only time you would do renal artery stenting would typically be if PTA failed or if there was a complication from the angioplasty like a dissection, then a stent may be placed. And if these patients are asymptomatic, they'll often just be followed. And this is a case where the curved planar reformats and then also the 3D VR images actually show it better than the standard MIPS. So these are coronal MIP images, and you can see the beaded appearance of the renal artery here and also on the left, but I think they're much more apparent on the volume rendered in CPR images in this case. All right, last case, bilateral common femoral vein color and pulse Doppler.
All right, so the color Doppler images here show that the common femoral veins are patent bilaterally, so we don't see any common femoral vein thrombosis, but the waveforms are a bit unusual. They're monophasic, meaning they have a non-pulsatile homogeneous flow pattern. So just to compare, this is how a common femoral vein waveform normally would look. You get this normal respiratory variation where you have this undulating contour. And that's because with the increasing and decreasing intrathoracic pressures from breathing, that gets transmitted to the central veins and then the peripheral veins, and you'll see this normal wavy appearance to the common femoral vein waveform. Now, when you start seeing a more monophasic waveform, then you have to worry about something interrupting the transmission of those respiratory variations to the vein. And that's usually due to a problem with a more proximal vein, like one of the external iliac veins or the common iliac veins. And that could be due to a DVT in one of those veins. It could be due to something causing extrinsic compression of one of those veins, like a mass or hematoma or lymphadenopathy, or even something called May Thurner syndrome, where the right common iliac artery can compress the left common iliac vein. Or it could be due to intrinsic luminal narrowing of a more proximal vein, like if there was a prior DVT in an external iliac vein and it left a residual stenosis. Now, when you have bilateral monophasic common femoral vein waveforms, like in this case, then you start worrying about an IVC abnormality or bilateral iliac vein thrombosis or something else causing bilateral extrinsic compression. You can even see that in obesity and large volume ascites. And actually, the American College of Radiology practice parameters for peripheral venous ultrasound examinations currently recommend looking at that contralateral common femoral vein venous waveform, even if only one leg is ordered for evaluation, just because you may pick up more proximal venous abnormalities. But in this case, Case, what do you think the cause of this blunted waveform was bilaterally? Right, the patient is pregnant, so the gravid uterus was compressing upon the iliac veins, and this is actually physiologic monophasicity of the common femoral veins. All right, that's it for five cases in five minutes. Vascular imaging number four. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be fabulous if you share these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info, and you can also follow us on social media there to get updates. Thanks, and have a great day.